What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the studio by my producer, Joel. And today, we are diving into the very dark and honestly haunting history of two landmarks in the Great Down Under, or Australia, as we call it here in the States. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the Devil's Pool and the Uluru Rock or Ayers Rock, as it's called. I just wanted to preface this episode by saying that I am not from Australia, as you probably know and can tell from my very American accent. (laughs) But I do my very best to get the pronunciations right for the names and places in this episode. But again, I'm never going to get them 100% right. So just bear with me. And any Aussies out there, if you want to correct me, by all means do so. I'd love to learn how to say these words, names, and places correctly. So in the middle of Queensland's rich rainforest of waterfalls and mossy rocks, a deadly pool churns along Babinda Creek. Australian bush and vegetation surround the waterways. It's a place where three streams meet among a group of boulders, creating pools of water in several spots along the rock formations. At first glance, The water seems gentle and inviting even, but it's known to become violent at the drop of a hat. The water remains cool even in the hottest months. Small waterfalls cascade over the rocks and meet in larger pools that look great for swimming. So after a mile hike through the humid wilderness, it's no wonder people are tempted to take a swim in the cool water. It's a place known as Bobinda Boulders. Or that's what tourists call it anyway. Bobinda is from an indigenous word meaning mountain. And the Bobinda Creek sits in the valley between two mountains. But by locals, it's known by the much more sinister name, the Devil's Pool. It was given the name for its long history of mysterious deaths and the mystical haunting that hides in its waterways. The legend of the pool spans back to the days of unrecorded history and the tale that surrounds the mysterious pool has been passed down by word of mouth for decades. Long before Western colonists arrived in Australia, the Yadinji tribe inhabited the region. They were indigenous people who inhabited the northernmost part of Queensland, and their land spanned 400 square miles of the lowland rainforest that bordered other aboriginal lands of Australia. As colonization began in the 1800s, they were moved from most of their territory to make room for cattle stations and sugarcane plantations. A young man known as Jack Kane remembered how he and his fellow colonists rounded up the Yadinji people in 1884. During a week-long campaign, Queensland and native police surrounded the Yadinji camp known as Skull Pocket. As the sun rose on the first morning, a warning shot rang out from one of the colonists. The Yadinji men scattered around the camp and rushed towards the colonists, but they had no chance. They were completely surrounded by men with firearms aimed towards the camp, so they were gunned down before they could ever fight back. After the slaughter, Jack watched as the police raided the camp and smashed the skulls of the Yadinji children. Some of the men stabbed the children through the head with knives, and the only Indinji members that survived were the men and women who had broken off from the rest of the tribe long before the ambush occurred. But no one at Skull Pocket survived the attack. In 1910, the Indinji that remained in the area were forced to move into Anglican missions under Queensland government policy. By then, the indigenous tribes of Queensland were fractured. Aboriginal elders tried to organize each tribe into one collective tribe but the language barriers were too complicated. In 2014, 40 members of the Indinji people renounced their ties to the Australian government, and they formed the sovereign Indinji government, reclaiming their land in northern Queensland. And in this region, the story of the Devil's Pool supposedly comes from an old Indinji legend, a tale of love, loss, and revenge. Long ago, the tribe's leader, Waronu, was engaged to marry a young girl named Ulana. She was chosen to be his bride, but she never loved him and never would. One morning, Waronu woke up and noticed that she wasn't beside him. He heard through the grapevine that she was seen the night before, leaving with a man from another tribe named Diga. 
Waranu was known for his short temper, and he was quickly filled with rage and jealousy. So he grabbed a spear, gathered his warriors, and began hunting down Ulana and her lover. They had fled into the rainforest, but didn't get very far. Warunu and his men tracked down the two lovers to Babinda Creek as the sun set over the horizon. They drew their weapons and cornered them at the edge of a giant boulder. Ulana and Diga clutched each other and knew this was the end. Just behind them, the creek ran gently along the rocks below, and seeing that they had nowhere else to go, Diga and Ulana jumped into the stream. Spears and arrows flew through the water that surrounded them. The men chanted and yelled at the surface, and Warunu demanded that they bring back Diga's head on the end of a spear. But Diga swam deeper and deeper into the creek, until Ulana and the other men could no longer see him. The outline of his legs and arms pumping through the water disappeared into the depths, and he dodged the spears and the arrows, but he dove too far and stayed underwater for too long. He gasped for air, but his lungs filled with water. He would rather risk drowning than return to the death that waited for him at the surface. As Ulana swam to the surface for air, she looked around for Diga, but all she saw was Diga's body floating to the top. He bobbed up from the water while his head hung beneath the surface, lifeless. Realizing her lover had drowned, she became blind with rage. She let out a scream, so filled with anger and grief that the men around her dropped their weapons and covered their ears. The high-pitched howl echoed within the valley until small cracks formed in the sides of the boulders. The small cracks grew along the rocks until they exploded into hundreds of pieces. The splintered rock shot across the creek and the men ducked for cover. Below the gentle flow of the Babinda Creek became a raging whirlwind of water. The water frothed and bubbled as it churned as chaos surrounded them. The boulders near Ulana fractured and sank into the water, and peacefully she accepted her fate, and she sank along with them. As she fell into the depths, the last thing the men could see was her beautiful face, just before it disappeared into the violent white water. So for years after Ulana's disappearance into the Babinda Creek, the Yudinji men could sense a vengeful energy near the water, and as a result they began mysteriously dying whenever they got close. They used to fish in the creek and bathe themselves, but these brave men soon turned into cowards when they saw the other men dragged down into the depths by disembodied hands. They claimed to see Ulana's face just beneath the surface before the cold, dead hands grasped their ankles. As the other men panicked and jumped out of the creek, they turned around to see the bodies of their brothers, friends, and fathers floating to the surface, dead. The same way Ulana had to watch Diga float to the surface. This was Ulana's revenge for the loss of her lover, and she would continue to kill the men throughout the years. But slowly, her legend faded with time, as the Adinji were stripped of their lands. But as time passed, the dark, twisted energy inside the Devil's Pool remained. Ulana's spirit lures men into the pool, and her cries for Diga can still be heard. Today, the pool where the water foams is said to be the most dangerous during the wet season. But Aboriginal elders warn that the area near the Babinda boulders are hazardous all year round. The elders also call the spot the washing machine because the undercurrent makes it impossible for swimmers to escape the pool. Many visitors are cautioned to never swim and always be respectful of the nature around them. As the elders once said, if you disrespect the sacred site, the site will disrespect you in return. But many have ignored the warnings, and it was only a matter of time before a curious swimmer lost her life. The first recorded fatality occurred on June 10, 1933. A Queensland local named Winterbottom, went for a swim at the bottom of one of the Babinda waterfalls. As he swam towards the center of the pool, he noticed that a whirlpool had formed, and before he knew it, he was sucked down into the pool and never seen again. A local news outlet, the Canes Post, picked up the news story. They detailed the authorities' efforts, who scanned the entire pool but never found his body. In the end, they thought he must have been sucked into the pool waters and lodged somewhere in the many deep tunnels near the bottom. Many believe he just simply vanished. Only seven years later, in November of 1940, the Devil's Pool took its next victim. John Dominic English was an eight-year-old boy who took a swim in the cool waters of Babinda Creek. 
As his parents watched from the bank, John was suddenly yanked down underneath the water. As his parents and other tourists nearby swam to save John, it was already too late. He had drowned almost instantly. Their only mercy was that his body was recovered and not lost forever. Today, anyone who visits the Babinda boulders will notice the official viewing platforms that have pathways leading down to the pools, but they are now securely fenced off and warning signs surround the area. There's a small memorial plaque in the center of one of the viewing platforms, and its inscription reads, He came for a visit and stayed forever. And it's dedicated to Pete McGann, the 24-year-old who met his fate on June 22, 1979. On a hot summer day, Pete visited the Bobinda Pools with a few of his friends. A few of them wanted to climb through the rock formations leading to the top of the waterfalls. It was a fairly easy climb up the jagged rock face, and they slowly worked their way up towards the top. As Pete was on his way up, he spotted a hole between a group of rocks. He stood up above the hole and planned on jumping the gap. He shouted to his friends, and they looked back at him to watch his stunt, but Peter never made it across the gap. He backed up and got a running start, but when he jumped across the gap, it was like a supernatural force had grabbed him midair. He lost all forward momentum and fell straight down into the gap. He disappeared so quickly that his friends didn't even hear him scream for help, and his body vanished in the white, foamy waters below. His friends quickly ran for help and paramedics arrived at the scene alongside a crew of local rescue workers. They dove into the Devil's Pool several times, but the undercurrents were far too strong. When rescue workers got too far into the pool, they would feel themselves being pulled deeper into the water, and it soon became impossible to find Pete. They delayed the dive for another six weeks until the pool settled down. Experienced divers finally made their way into the pool where they found Pete's body swirling in the underwater currents. His body was bloated and his skin was deadly white as the surging waters had trapped him under the surface for a month and a half. Pete's memorial plaque still stands on one of the viewing platforms and it acts as a remembrance of Pete's tragedy and a warning to anyone who thinks they should fool around near the Devil's Pool. Unfortunately, many have taken the warning seriously. On a sunny morning, November 30th, 2008, Four young men traveled to the Babinda Pools for a day of relaxation, and one of the men was a 23-year-old from Tasmania named James Bennett. He was a veteran submarine lieutenant in the Australian Navy, and he had worked on a minesweeper called the HMAS Norman. James and his friends parked their cars and hiked to the famous tourist spot. They noticed a few local kids swimming in one of the pools, and they thought it'd be a good idea to try it out for themselves. By 2008, several safety rails and warning signs had been placed all along the Babinda boulders, warning everyone about the risk of death if they swim in the pools. But as most of us do, uh, that won't happen to me. James and his friends hopped the safety rails and ignored the signs. They thought if little kids could swim in the pools, then they could easily handle it. So they made their way through a few pathways between the giant boulders surrounding the water and eventually they came across a massive, beautiful pool located underneath one of the viewing platforms. It looked like a perfect place to swim. James and his friends took off their clothes and jumped into the cool waters of the Devil's Pool. They swam around and splashed each other, and they were all having a good time. But after 10 minutes, James's friends watched as he shot his hands up in the air in panic. With a frightful look across his face, he cried out in terror. His friends watched as something or someone dragged James straight downwards into the deep. His head and hands vanished underneath the surface. At first, his friends thought he was just messing around, but then he knew something was seriously wrong when James's hands reappeared at the surface. They thrashed around the water, grabbing at the air, like James was trying to reach for something to hold on to. They watched as James struggled just beneath the water. He was only a few feet below the surface, but for some reason he couldn't swim up. Something was holding him down beneath the water, but they couldn't see what it was. In fear of being dragged down along with him, his friends jumped out of the water and began searching for anything that could help rescue him. They tore off branches from nearby trees and tried hanging them out over the water so that James could grab a hold onto them, but it was no use, as James had already disappeared into the depths. Nothing was left besides a small wake where he had been thrashing his arms. 
When authorities asked James's friends what had happened, all they could say was that he was pulled down in the water by an invisible force and that they couldn't explain it any further. After the death of James Bennett, local authorities officially declared the Babinda Pools a no-go zone and they forbid anyone from swimming in the waters. But just like before, the warnings and safety rails weren't going to stop people from testing their luck. What's even worse is that some of the deaths at Devil's Pool have been caused even when people have followed the safety precautions. In one reported case, a couple visited the Babinda Pools during a heavy rainstorm. The rain that fell had built up a surge of water for several miles up the creek. These rainstorms could add several feet of water to the already dangerous undercurrents. The couple found a place at one of the lower walkways where they asked one of the volunteer lifeguards to take their picture. As they handed over the camera and got into position, the surge of stormwater blasted over the boulders below. A massive burst of water sliced across the walkway, knocking the man and woman into the devil's pool. They tried to grab onto the rock beneath them, but it was too slippery to hold onto, and the current dragged them towards the whirlpool. The lifeguard immediately dropped the camera and dove in after them. The dangerous vortex was much larger than usual from the extra stormwater, but through the torrent he managed to find the woman and bring her back to safety. Unfortunately for the other man, though, he never resurfaced. The current had sucked him into the vortex and killed him within minutes. This wouldn't be the last time storm flooding would claim a victim. Several others have been killed by the surging waters. It's as if Ulana's reach extends beyond the pool when she can no longer contain her vengeance. Another story involves an unnamed 15-year-old schoolboy from a nearby district. His class had visited the pools for a field trip one day since the area is known for its unique geography. But like a typical 15-year-old boy, he decided to cause some trouble. He had spent most of the day littering along the trails, drawing small graffiti across the warning signs and hopping over guardrails. The whirlpool churned down below, almost as if the spirit of the Babinda pools became angry with the boy. And soon, the words of the elders would become true. If you disrespect the sacred site, the site will disrespect you. The last straw was when the boy decided to kick the memorial plaque dedicated to Pete McGann, and his fate was sealed. Soon after kicking the plaque, he was fooling around on the wrong side of one of the guardrails when he slipped on a track of mud. He ended up sliding all the way down the side of the muddy bank towards one of the pools. Its water looked like a washing machine at full force. Large waves crowded at the edges and a vortex twisted at its core. In a heartbeat, the boy's body slid down the muddy bank. His fingernails sank into the mud as he tried to stop himself, but it was no use, and he plunged straight into the pool and vanished into the white, frothy waters. All that was left behind were his claw marks left in the side of the muddy bank and the boot print that he had left on the memorial plaque just above. Death after death, it became impossible to ignore the overwhelming amount of people losing their lives at the Devil's Pool. The victims kept stacking up even after dozens of warning signs and safety rails had been installed. Many people suspected that the Babinda Pools were just a naturally dangerous place with slippery landscapes, violent waters, and lethal undercurrents. But many suspected there was something else going on, something that couldn't be explained naturally. For the witnesses who have been present while their friends and family lost their lives, many have been convinced a sinister energy with violent intentions has consumed the pool and their deaths weren't just a natural tragedy. Many believe that something deep in the Devil's Pool operates outside of natural law. Many have even said that they've heard the voice of a woman calling out to nearby men, trying to lure them into the cool waters. Some have visited the pools after a victim had lost their life there, and a haunting energy clings to the air. And many claim you can see a woman's face carved into the bottom of the rocky pool, but it vanishes after a short moment. Many believe this could be the face of Ulana. Some also say that the ghostly outline of the previous victims can be seen standing at the edge of the pool, but only for a split second. It's been recorded that more than 20 people have died at the Babinda boulders. Most of them have been male tourists, and every single victim has been killed by drowning, even the ones that had no intention of swimming. Rescue divers have also mentioned bizarre experiences while under the surface of Devil's Pool. One of the rescue workers remembered how one of their searches lasted for nearly five weeks. They dove in and out of the water but couldn't find the alleged victim. 
Some of the divers began suspecting that there might not have been a victim in the first place, since they still hadn't found the body, but eventually they found the dead swimmer. Their skin was a ghostly shade of white, and their arms reached towards the surface, looking like their body wanted to float upwards, but couldn't for some reason. When the divers got closer to the body, it was hard to see why the body was trapped, but they could all feel the infamous force pulling them down towards the bottom. When they inspected the body, they noticed the victim's feet had been caught in a slew of rocks and foliage. As they fought against the downward current, the rescuers hacked away at the underwater plants and pushed the stones away from the victim's feet. After a day of work, the body still wouldn't budge, exhausted from their work and fighting the current all day. The rescue divers called it quits, at least for now. When they got back to the surface, they would agree that they would come back and try again. On the third attempt, rescuers gathered at the pool and began gearing up for their dive, when suddenly they heard a gentle disturbance out in the water, and a few ripples moved away from the center of the pool. There they saw the white, bloated body and it had appeared at the surface by itself. It was as if the devil's pool decided to finally let go of its victim after five weeks of trapping them there. Dead bodies getting trapped in the pools was a common occurrence. Other dead bodies had been found twirling around in the undercurrents. It was so common that many believe that the victim count is actually much higher than 20. Some also believe that bodies have entirely disappeared in the pools, just like Ulana, who was once completely consumed by the mayhem. As the legend lives on, others have a more practical theory on where the bodies go. When tourists visit the Babinda boulders, Australian locals are quick to tell the tragic story of Ulana and the fate of her lover, and many warn tourists about the mystical energy that resides there. But the locals also understand the nature of the area. There are enough currents and crevices down in the water where bodies could become trapped. Several underground caves and tunnels connect to the Babinda pools. So many of the locals explain that the disappearances are because of the complex series of hidden areas down where no one can see. Since the site was created thousands of years ago by several waterways, it's no wonder there are so many tunnels that have been carved away by the force of water over the years. Still, the Babinda Pools are regarded as one of the most tragic places in Australia, and several more people have lost their lives there in the past few years. Whether the pools are haunted by the vengeful force of Ulana, or their undercurrents are simply a strong, mysterious force of nature. The area needs to be respected. Either way, the Devil's Pool has a track record for eagerly dragging people down to their deaths. And the swimming ban, the railings, and the warning signs haven't been enough to stop people from losing their lives in the unforgiving waters. I can definitely see the appeal for wanting to visit the Devil's Pool. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. The water is very, very clear, looks inviting, but man, does that sound scary to actually go down into the water, but people still do. But I wanted to mention that the Devil's Pool is located south of one of the larger cities in Australia. I guess it's not huge by any means, but a city called Cairns. I believe I'm saying that right. It's spelled C-A-I-R-N-S, but in Australia, they pronounce it as Cairns which is kind of interesting, but I actually had the privilege of going to Australia four years ago and I actually went to the city of Keynes and I went on a tour um, with an, a local there who took me up to the Daintree Rainforest and I regret not going down and seeing the Devil's Pool while I was there because it, it's really not that far from where we were staying in Keynes, but Keynes for just reference is, is a great launching point for going to see the Great Barrier Reef. And that was where I took an excursion to go see the Great Barrier Reef, which is which was awesome. But I definitely regret not going down to the Devil's Pool and the Babinda Boulders and seeing seeing that while I was there. But hopefully one day I can go back to Australia because it is a truly magical place uh, in every way. And the history and, and culture of the Aboriginals is, I believe, the oldest in the entire planet, which is crazy that they were here before anybody else so there's just so much culture lore legend whatever you want to call it history that they bring to the table and the devil's pool is definitely one that still haunts people to today but now we're going to transition and visit another location in australia known as Ayers rock or it's known by the ancient name 
of Uluru. Before we get into that, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. A lot of people didn't even make resolutions this year. And you know what? I get it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't still find a way to shake things up. Whether it's by switching up your workout routine or going someplace new. Whatever way you challenge yourself this year, there's no better way to do it than with a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds. Raycon wireless earbuds are the best way to bring audio with you because no matter how much you shake things up, literally no matter how much you shake, you know they won't fall out of your ears. And I gotta say, this is 100% true. I use the Raycon wireless earbuds when I work out and my head's moving all which way on the elliptical and treadmill, whatever else I'm using, and they have never fallen out, which is so nice. And so many other earbuds I've had always fall out and then they're rolling underneath the machines and I look like an idiot crawling around on the floor looking for my missing earbud, but not with the Raycon Everyday Earbuds. They look and feel and sound better than ever. What's great is they also have an awareness mode for when you need to listen to your surroundings. So you can take Raycons with you wherever you go. You know, you're walking down the street, crossing crosswalks, you need to look out for cars. That awareness mode is super crucial to making sure you don't die on that daily walk of yours. With optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit, these earbuds are so comfortable that they will not budge and they won't make your ears hurt if you fall asleep in them, which is super, super nice. I use them every night to fall asleep listening to relaxing, calming music or my Planet Sleep podcast. And right now, Lights Out listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash lights out. That's buyraycon.com slash lights out to save 15% off on Raycons. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash lights out. And our last sponsor for today is Bombas. Bombas's mission is simple. Make the most comfortable clothes ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. So when you buy Bombas, you're always giving to someone in need. Bombas designed their socks, shirts, and underwear to be the clothes you can't wait to put on every day. Everything they make is soft, seamless, and tagless, and has a luxuriously cozy feel to them. They're made from super soft materials like merino wool, pima cotton, and even cashmere, which makes them the perfect cozy layers. There's a pair of Bombas socks for everything you do. They come in tons of options, dress socks, sports socks, any type of sock you can think of, they've got it. Bombas t-shirts are made with thoughtful design features like invisible seams, soft fabrics, and the perfect weight so they hang just right. And Bombas's underwear has a barely there feel with second skin support that might make you forget they're even there in a good way though. And did you know that socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items at homeless shelters? That's why Bombas donates one for every item you buy. I love their mission. People need clothing out there. So why not get yourself some new clothing that's super comfortable, mind you, and also help somebody in need. Go to bombas.com slash lights out and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash lights out for 20% off. Again, check out bombas.com slash lights out today. So the next cursed legend of Australia that we're going to talk about takes us to the heart of the outback way out in the middle of nowhere in Australia is a rock formation known as Ayers Rock. But it mostly goes by the ancient name of Uluru. This massive red rock formation is taller than the Eiffel Tower at 1,142 feet and has a perimeter of almost six miles around. It lies within the home of the aboriginal Anangu people and it's considered one of the most sacred places in the world. It's also one of the most prized natural wonders in Australia. Uluru was formed nearly 300 million years ago. As the continents formed, so did vast mountain ranges. From these mountain ranges, their formations slowly eroded over tens of millions of years and left massive pools of sediment piled up in a single location. This pile of sediment hardened and eventually formed the gigantic structure of Uluru. The softer rock eroded around it, revealing the majestic red rock beneath. But despite its beauty and awe, many claim that a curse has taken control of the area, and this curse is somehow connected to its ancestral past. According to the Anangu legend, their story tells a different tale of how the natural wonder was created. In the beginning, the world was nothing. It wasn't until the creator beings arrived that they began adding the elements of life. Then came people, plants, and animals, and eventually they formed the landscape as we see it today. They believe Anangu land is still inhabited by the spirits of these ancestral creators. As for Uluru, 
Several different ancestral stories explain how the rock formation came to be. One says that Uluru was built by two boys playing in the mud after the rain during the creation period. This explains the streaks and cracks in the rock formation. When they finished playing, they traveled across the land and eventually rested on top of Mount Connor, where their bodies turned into boulders. Other stories tell of giant snake-like beings that battled on top of Uluru, leaving behind scars on the rock's surface. Another story tells of two ancestral tribes invited to a great feast, but on their way they were distracted by a group of beautiful, sleepy lizard women, so they never showed up to the feast. The host was so angry he sang out an evil song that formed into a mud sculpture of a living dingo. He sent the dingo to kill the leaders of both tribes. When the evil dingo sniffed out the men and found them with the lizard women, it tore through the encampment and ripped them all to shreds. Once they were all dead, the spot where their blood soaked into the ground beneath raised up towards the sky, creating Uluru, and the blood from the massacre permanently stained the rock red. Another story mentions a blue-tongued lizard named Lungkata. The lizard was an ancestral being. He came from the west and burned everything in his path on his way to Uluru. Once he arrived, he climbed to the top and found a cave which he made his home. Every day he left his cave to hunt the nearby emu. He gorged himself on the local birds and sat alone in his cave with a giant belly. And one day, while he was out hunting, he saw an emu with a spear sticking out of its side. It was being hunted by someone else. But the lizard came down from Uluru and snatched the wounded emu before the hunters could get it. And he took off. The original hunters tracked the bloodstains and came looking for their emu. At the end of the blood trail, they found the blue-tongued lizard. When they asked him what had happened to the bird, the lizard tried to hide the body and said they hadn't seen anything but because of the blood-stained trail, they knew the lizard was lying. So the lizard grabbed the dead emu from its hiding spot and tried to run away, up the side of Uluru. But the lizard was so full of emu, he couldn't run. So the hunters caught up to him and trapped him. And with their torches, they set the fire to the giant lizard and watched as it was engulfed in flames. As he burned to death, he rolled down the side of the giant rock formation, and as he skidded along the side of the rock, his skin peeled off his body, leaving charred strips of black leathery skin along the rock, all the way down to the bottom. Today, the dark strips along Uluru are said to be the lizard's charred skin. This is also one of the Anangu origin stories that explains why no one should climb Uluru, or their fate might be the same as the lizard. Many of these origin stories date back thousands of years, when aboriginal people first lived in the region. It is commonly believed that humans first settled near Uluru more than 10,000 years ago. Petroglyphs still cover some of the nearby walls. But in the 1870s, Europeans arrived in the western desert of Australia. And during this time, the Europeans named the natural wonder Ayers Rock, after the chief secretary of South Australia, Sir Henry Ayers. As they colonized the nearby land, they began setting up pastures for livestock. More and more, they encroached into the lands of the Anangu people. As their livestock grazed, a drought came over the land and food in the area was hard to come by. This created tension between the colonists and the Anangu people. Soon violence broke out more frequently and the colonists formed more police patrols. In 1918, the Australian government created the Aboriginals Ordinance, which made this territory a government-run settlement where Aboriginal people were forced to live. The Uluru land acted as an Aboriginal reserve for nearly three years. As tourism to the areas increased, permanent European settlements began taking land in the 1940s. Soon permanent roads were built, and tour bus services started in the early 1950s. And by the end of the 1950s, the area had become a popular national park. The first motel leases had been granted, and they constructed an airstrip to the northern side of Uluru. As more tourists flooded in, a chain was drilled into the rock formation to help tourists climb Uluru in 1963. It wasn't until 1985 that the Australian government finally returned ownership of Uluru to the Aboriginal people, but under one condition. The Anangu people had to lease the land back to the government for 99 years so that it could be a national park. The Anangu people agreed, but they demanded that climbing would be banned and the chain for climbing would be removed. Prime Minister Bob Hawke initially agreed, but later broke his promise. The Anangu people never climb Uluru because it is seen as a sacred place 
but of course that didn't stop tourists from climbing it for decades. In 2005, they installed a warning on the visitor's guide suggesting to respect the law and the culture of the Anangu people. And just like the warnings at the Devil's Pool, people disregarded the signs. After they began recording attendance, at least 37 people have reportedly died while climbing. Some of the deaths were accidents, like people slipping or being careless. But others believe that the cursed energy that remains from the tail of the blue-tongued lizard has an effect on climbers. Not only that, but people began disrespecting the site. In 2010 alone, visitors were caught hitting golf balls off the top of the monument and taking off their clothes while running around naked. And more and more tourists began plunging down the sides of Uluru to their deaths. In 2017, the National Park Board finally voted unanimously to forbid the climbing of Uluru. And when people heard the news, there was a surge in climbers and visitors before the ban was announced. It wasn't until October 26, 2019, that the chain for climbing was finally removed. The Anangu have also requested that visitors do not take photographs in certain areas of Uluru. There are sex-specific ceremonies that take place near the rock formation, and they are forbidden to be seen by the opposite sex, even if it's only in a photograph. These traditions come from Jekarpa beliefs known as the dreaming. These ceremonies deal with the time when the land of Uluru was inhabited by ancestral figures. This was a time known as every wind. It holds a complex of meanings and their rituals have a special place in aboriginal spirituality. These creation stories are inherited through Anangu culture and they are passed down from generation to generation. Some are protected by specific households, others belong only to men or only to women, and they are seen as a rite of passage. So if one of them accidentally saw these sacred locations on Uluru, even if it's only a photograph, it's believed that terrible things could happen to them. But bad luck has mostly come to the tourists that visit Uluru. As for one of the most famous curses of Uluru, many believe it has something to do with stealing rocks from the area. One victim of the curse was a man named Steve Hill. He visited Uluru in June of 2017. When he was near the rock formation base with his family, he spotted an ordinary red stone, no bigger than his palm. And he didn't think much of it, besides the fact that it looked cool, so he picked it up and put it in his pocket. The rest of his family warned him not to take the rock, but he ignored them. And from that moment on, Steve felt like a haunting shadow followed him everywhere he went. He experienced the worst luck he had ever experienced in his life. Most of it dealt with his off-road four-wheel drive vehicle. And one day, while he was out driving in the Australian countryside, he spotted a pack of kangaroos leaping towards him out of the corner of his eye. At first, they looked like regular kangaroos. But as they got closer, Steve saw their eyes were glossed over and drool was dripping out of their mouths. And they leaped closer and closer to his vehicle as he sped down the dirt road. Until finally, they bashed into his four-wheeler, causing him to lose control and he lurched off the side of the road. Luckily, the pack of wild kangaroos continued on the left of him in the desert and he was able to make it back home safe, but soon after his engine wouldn't start. It sputtered out until it burst into flames. Later, as he went through his old photos on his phone, he realized that all the ones he had taken of Uluru had mysteriously disappeared. He knew it wasn't a coincidence that these strange things were happening, so he decided to return the rock to its original location. He drove nearly 1,900 miles from Canberra back to Uluru to personally return the stone and he later admitted that he was a complete idiot for taking it in the first place. But Steve wasn't the first to steal a rock from the sacred site of Uluru, and he wouldn't be the last. Each year, the National Park's main office gets more than 350 packages containing rocks and sand taken from the site from people all over the world. Many packages come with notes saying that the people who took the stones or sand had terrible luck after taking them. Steve returned his rock within a year, but some people finally returned theirs after almost 40 years. And the largest package they ever got back was a stone that weighed over 70 pounds. Although the Anangu people don't recognize the curse, the act of stealing rocks and sand from the area is disrespectful to their beliefs and cultures. They also believe that returning a rock to the wrong spot is also disrespectful. So park managers have struggled with the number of rocks that have been returned. Instead, they use the return stones for repairs in areas where erosion and flood runoff cause problems. But on top of that, there's been an issue with micropathogens. Since some of the rocks have traveled across the world and returned to Australia, there is a chance of contamination, 
which could cause another pandemic. So the Australian Quarantine Inspection Service has to intercept and treat each rock coming from overseas. In the end, though, it's best to leave nature where you found it and respect the aboriginal sacred sites that have existed for thousands and thousands of years. But apparently for some, it's just too tempting to leave a cool looking rock where it is. For both Uluru and the Devil's Pool, these sacred sites have existed long before us and they'll continue to exist long after we're gone. Whether you believe in the spiritual energies that inhabit these places or not, they still stand as incredibly powerful feats of nature from the mysterious undercurrents of the Devil's Pool that leads to hidden tunnels beneath, to the sheer size of Uluru and the 550 million years of history, these places demand respect, and those who don't take them seriously have sealed their own fate. If the signs and safety rails aren't enough of a warning, then take the advice of the Australian Aboriginal Elders. If you disrespect the sacred site, the site will disrespect you and ain't that the truth while i was in australia and in canes i i had the privilege to sit with an aboriginal elder oh nice on the beach and got to listen to him play his didgeridoo oh, you know those cool. didgeridoos they um like a flute or yeah it's got a really unique sound to it maybe we can okay. put a little, little yeah clip of i'll one find it playing here because <laughs> yeah. it's really quite amazing it's a very very ancient instrument that nice. uh, the aboriginals play but the aboriginals are some of the most fascinating people mm. on the planet and just they they were literally here before anybody else like they are the oldest civilization on the face of oh, the planet wow. like their history goes back far more than any other group of individuals or culture i, I believe that's ever walked this earth which is really cool it just shows you how much history there is mm -hmm. and, and how they were here since creation wow like their stories go all the way back to the creation of of the planet and it's interesting because there's a lot of references to um alien like creatures these ancestral beings um were like star people uh -huh. that they believe they came from the stars they must be so knowledgeable right you would, all the yeah, stuff they yeah see. and i mean it's it's crazy because a lot of people just kind of I feel like don't give ancient, uh, don't give these cultures and these indigenous peoples the respect that they deserve. Like these yeah. indigenous peoples were here way before any of our right, ancestors right. were. Like they were here millions of years potentially. Uh -huh. And so it's like, why aren't we taking their traditions and knowledge more seriously and their history more seriously? And why are, why did why are we so hell bent on like wiping it all out? Uh -huh. like, and it's just sad that it's it's worked out the way that it has for indigenous peoples across the world and that you know we came in and basically stole all their land i mean mm -hmm. it's interesting because there's a lot of crossover not only with native americans um and the the different tribes that existed here in north america but you even go to uh the hawaiians oh, the hawaiians yeah. have very similar stories and uh there's I, I can't remember the exact name of the beach and there might be several beaches but it's the same type of thing they huh. tell you not to take a rock or a stone from that and uh we went to it before and i know that we talked about kendall and i talked about make sure we don't take any of the rocks here because people send them back because bad things happen to them if you take it oh smart of you guys you're not chancing yeah. anything yeah exactly <laughs> it's that. like no way it's like yeah you, i i think you have to respect these sacred sites and there is something more going on here than just folklore and stories and mm -hmm. whatever you know people like to dismiss and be skeptical of it and just be like ah you know they're just you know uneducated they don't know what they're talking about they don't know science and this and that but right. it's like it's far more complex than that and mm -hmm. i don't think science can explain everything mm. science doesn't know the answers to all the mysteries of the universe and doesn't understand the mysteries of these sacred sites or or science can't explain how life began it can theorize yeah. we're able to theorize the way life began evolution the big bang but for all we know one of these ancient cultures maybe they were there when it, you know maybe what stories they tell us are in fact true so mm -hmm. i just find it all very just special and yeah. it's something that i love talking about 
ancient cultures and especially indigenous people because I have a lot of respect for them. I've oh, yeah. met a number of 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 elders in different indigenous uh, cultures and and tribes and things like that. And mm-hmm. I always find their stories so fascinating because it's like so much more exciting than like our history, you know. Yeah, just like right. it's just like cool we like traveled across the mayflowers mm-hmm. you know like i'm just giving a yeah. rough example it's like cool well, like i i feel like the indigenous people were in touch with yes this supernatural power or spiritual uh, spiritual the yeah. spirituality of of indigenous peoples is something that is you can't discount it and mm-hmm. you can't just write it off as i feel like they're they understand the the energy of like I, I believe that, you know, we refer to a lot of people refer to the planet that we're on as Mother Earth, right? Yeah. Or Gaia or some people call it. There's other names for it. But like, I truly believe that everything is alive. I believe the Earth is alive. It's a living, conscious being. Uh-huh. That it is like our mother. Yeah. Everything, all life that exists on planet Earth is the offspring of Mother Earth. Uh-huh. And I think that the indigenous peoples across the world understood that very early on because they they learned to respect it, to hold it sacred, and that all life is sacred. And through living on this planet and you know hunting, gathering, using resources, and and surviving on this planet for so many years, long before Europeans came and took over the world, mm-hmm. that they truly understood how special the relationship is between you as a living breathing person yeah. and the environment that surrounds you the the animals the plants and mother earth and i think it's interesting because i think they have they understand that better than we do and and i think if more people understood that we'd be in a far different place than we're in right now as definitely a, as a people and society here on on this planet so I take I take their story seriously, and I yeah. I honestly believe a lot of a lot of what they have uh-huh. to say because it it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And like you know, whether there was a battle with a lizard, whatever you want to call it, you know, I think there's there's clearly something to that. They're not just uh-huh. you know telling stories for no, fun. No, it's not just entertainment for them. I mean, there might be more to that. I think it's interesting that potentially you know their origin, their Aboriginal origin origin story has to deal with some sort of star people or some other beings from some other place in the universe coming to this planet to help create it is, mm-hmm. is very interesting. It is. And uh, I do, I, I really believe the devil's pool. I think the devil's pool is a hundred percent got this energy. Yeah. This residual. I, I don't think science can spirit. explain devil's pool. I think. Yeah. I mean, the skeptics, skeptics would say, you know, it's just the undercurrents of the pool and it's the natural, natural thing going on there. Yeah. But it's like, Sure, you could say that about anything. Now you can mm-hmm. say anything's a natural thing, and sure, there might be explanations of there's crevices in the rocks yeah. you could get stuck in, and maybe that's part of some of the reasons people died. But it doesn't explain all of them. All doesn't. of it, right? Yeah. So you have to wonder, like, there could be something that no one has really even thought of right. going on there. And the fact that so many men mm-hmm. have died there is very mm-hmm. interesting. There's a connection with that, it seems right. And Ulana is the the woman that's supposedly haunting yeah, yeah possessing this pool still to this day mm. i personally would not want to take a swim in that pool after all that no it, it'd be cool to like cool to see see and see see the signs and yeah. <laughs> not set foot in it <laughs> no. especially as a guy yeah so. but it's interesting that there's these sites and landmarks across the world where strange things happen mm-hmm. and there's some paranormal element to it that provides honestly more explanation oftentimes than anything scientific can Mm -hmm. and i just am so fascinated by it and i hope you are too and definitely let us know what other places like devil's pool babinda boulders and uluru and others out there and maybe there's some others in australia that i'm missing i'd love to know but i'd love to cover more natural landmarks that have paranormal yeah. stories to it well i know recently on mile higher you guys covered the alaskan triangle and some yeah, other locations yeah. that right have similarities to this type of power going on yeah spiritual vortexes yeah energy vortexes there's something very real to that and there's just too many connections 
between stories and between locations across the planet that you can't just you just can't dismiss it you can't just say that this is all coincidence this is all by chance and people that say that and are know-it-alls about it be like oh yeah it can all be explained away i just i don't i don't understand people's way of thinking i think you have to be more open-minded Definitely. about it and you have to be open to the fact that maybe there's things that science can't explain maybe there's things that as humans we can't even begin to understand because it's beyond our abilities to yeah. comprehend yeah i mean my god like we have five senses but what about that sixth sense you know what about the things that we can't feel touch see smell mm-hmm. here like there's other things going on we know that for a fact there's other layers to this reality that we can't see and you know you can dive into the world of psychedelics and everything else and then you see a whole nother part of it and you know people are like oh it's just drugged but like there's something more to that yeah right you know why especially with psychedelics and a lot of times dealing with you know whether it's mushrooms whatever you want whatever you want to call it you know ayahuasca with the people yeah. of uh, the amazonian indigenous peoples have been using ayahuasca mm-hmm. for centuries yeah a long time to you know it, it, cure themselves and yeah. all these things and it can help provide that sixth sense that doesn't exist right. without it. right i love the quote that i have three eyes two to look and one to see uh uh-huh. yeah and the one to see is referring to the third eye which is very a very interesting concept and there's a whole other layer of of stuff going on there with the pineal gland and and all that maybe we'll dive into that so let us let us know what you think I, i'm very open on this show and i love diving in the darker stuff but i love the paranormal stuff i love exploring some of the the ancient mysteries and mm-hmm. you know whether it's dark or just mysterious and unexplainable i mean i just love all of that stuff so if you love it let me know let us know what you want to see in the future but that is where we'll wrap up today's episode make sure you're following lights out on spotify Spotify is the podcast platform these days. It's the best way to support the show. Even if you don't want to watch the show or listen to the show on Spotify, just go over there, hit follow. It really helps us out. YouTube's also great too. Joel puts a ton of work into overlay and creating the visual experience for you. So always, it's it's awesome that he he spends so much time on it. And you know, we for those of you that are maybe listening on Apple Podcasts, maybe pop over to Spotify or check us out on YouTube so you can actually see the things that we we talk about because it's it's definitely worth yeah and thank you everyone for always your kind feedback and supporting the show yeah leave us ratings reviews we're always open to to both positive negative you know we're always looking to make the show better Mm -hmm. and how we can make this a better experience for you as a listener and viewer and also just one other side note i know a lot of you have been asking where merch is and merch is currently in the process of we're moving it internally into our company here to make it way better, way bigger than ever. So hang tight. We'll have merch back hopefully here soon in the next month or so. Working very hard to bring that back with some really cool stuff. But thanks again for joining us on Lights Out. And I will see you guys next time. Until then, Lights Out. Hey, everybody. <laughs>